DJ Easy Dick. <laughs> Remember that? I do. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell uh, Tucson that I've misread more or misheard more song lyrics. Gene, I thought that the Public Enemy song "Fight the Power." Mm. was what was it Tucson that I fight thought? the powers that be is the word is the is the is the correct phrase that's and the I, correct phrase and I said you gotta fight the power stampede trying to start a riot <laughs> <laughs> let's go I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. So glad to have you guys here with us tonight for what will continue to be a very spicy week of programming with a conversation tonight with friend of show Daniel Bessner about the problem with the overuse of the term fascism. Earlier this week, we kicked it off with firebrand Norm Finkelstein, where we attempted to discuss his book before we had some tangential derailment. It was still a great show that was followed up by a three and a half hour White Guy Wednesday struggle session on the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq with Spencer Leonard. Please, please check those shows out. Um, there's probably going to be a lot to discuss. You'll probably have a lot to say. Anything you have to say about those shows, do me a favor. Leave them in the comments. Um, we love reading comments. And by we, I mean Tucson. <laughs> Speaking of Toussaint, the designated comment reader, the faceless voice you hear to my right. <laughs> all around you. All around me is show producer, moderator extraordinaire, M. Toussaint. Hello, hello. So good to be here. And also, speaking of new shows like White Guy Wednesday, today, oh, actually, uh, tomorrow, Pascal Robert will be debuting his new show with Jeff Kennedy tomorrow morning called Frat Guy Friday. Quintern even made a new intro with a special Jazzy Jason beat, so I'm actually excited about that. Uh, speaking of intros, Ben Burgess and Stefan uh, have a new intro philosophy for the people that he did that's really cool and he did a special episode that aired earlier this morning so please go back and check that out if you haven't and he's still going to do his normal show on sunday for those of you that are subscribers and patrons thank you so much for your continued support that is the fuel in the engine of the tir machine if you listeners would also like access to champagne rooms past and present would like to be a live member of the Mau Mau, I want to say studio audience, Mau Mau virtual audience. There's only one way. Become a patron for as little as $3 a year or $30 for the month. It can all be yours. You can also join us for movie night. And I think this month we should do Fear of a Black Hat for the fun movie. What do you think? That sounds good. 
Someone suggested it, and it's a great movie. Well, let's bring in. Uh, there's no Pascal tonight. He's taking a break because, like I said, um, he's got his whole new show he's doing. He's doing it in the morning. We've had such a crazy week, and and I'm I'm I have to say I'm very honored that the this gentleman stepped up. He's a very important part of the show. He is a very quiet part of the show. But last night, uh, I was surprised he wanted to even get in front of a a camera of any kind please welcome everyone's favorite history professor at missouri state university mean gene bajlan what's up people uh good to see you jason good to see you well here you empty <laughs> and i'm and i'm looking forward to talking to danny about his article uh in the was it the new republic i believe the new uh, republic yes the yes. new I, republic I read, it, I read it again i read it again today um i have house guests here <laughs> At uh, Podcast Manor, uh, another podcaster is is here right now. My good friend Conan Neutron is here, so we're gonna we're gonna go out and because of all the shows that we've been doing, we're going to forego the champagne room tonight. Maybe we'll go a little bit longer uh, than usual. That's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> but I know I know Danny has a, a hard out. Uh, that's where we want to get just right into Danny. So we want to just go get straight into yeah. Danny. Let's get straight deep Let's into get straight into Danny. Deep into Danny. And well, talk talk about fascism. Danny asks a question: Does fascism exist in the political sphere? One of the worst insults hur hurled at popular political figures is tarring someone with the label fascist. We heard it with Bush Jr. and his uh, instituting of the post 9-11 Patriot Act. The rise of Trump for many is a rise of a fascistic element in society. But is it really? Did Trump do anything different than any other Republican president in the 20th century? His rhetoric was filled with racist epithets, but was the regime truly fascist? What does fascism, fascism look like in this current epoch? Well, we brought in the man who just wrote a piece about it in the new republic daniel besner to discuss tucson can you please bring in the one the only the host of the american prestige podcast danny besner coming your way hello everybody could you hear me Yo, yes, we, can we can hear you loud and clear we can, hear you. we can hear you loud and clear danny uh originally i wanted to do this show here in in mexico i thought it would be cool we can come down we could do it you know the weather actually is nice for a change here in the in the west coast has it been yeah. raining down there? Bruh. When you're done doing your thing, we'll we'll have a conversation. <laughs> I, we're, yeah, we're, I haven't paid attention, but yeah, it's been rough up here. But yeah, yeah no, unfortunately, Ben and I, I, I talked with Ben. His birthday is coming up. We talked about going up near you. Excellent. Yeah, let me let me know. Let me know. You, you were you. you were on this. Well, I want to read a, a a quote from your piece. Um, and I want to make sure I'm saying this this uh, this uh, political science's name right. It's Kuklik. Yes, I actually I think people mostly pronounce it Kuklik. I learned so it's Kuklik. Kuklik is better than Kuklik. I'm yeah, assuming. yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fascism, Kuklik. <laughs> exhaustive survey of U.S. politics and culture shows has greatly functioned as a so-called floating signifier. In the words of the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, who originated the phrase, a floating signifier is a term, quote, void of meaning and thus apt to receive any meaning. At one point or another, very political, uh, every political perspective in the United States has been identified as fascist. In the last two decades alone, Jonah Goldberg railed against liberal fascism, as Chris Hedges dubbed the Christian right American fascist. Dinesh D'Souza claimed that Hillary Clinton was fascist. Paul Krugman said the same about Trump. And even fringe ideologies weren't safe. Sebastian Gorka linked socialism with fascism, while Nouriel Rubini made similar claims about libertarianism. The one constant quality the term fascism has retained since the 1930s is its negative aliens. Almost no one uses it positively. Instead, to borrow Kuklik's <coughs> acid description, the term is the verbal equivalent of throwing a tomato at a speaker at a public event. Fascism, Kuklik shows, does not so much isolate a thing as it does some stigmatizing. Indeed, 
Fascism's power in American discourse comes from the fact that it has no stable meaning. It's mostly an all-purpose curse word, a highfalutin fuck this, which means that the fascism debate as currently constructed can never end. Danny, what was the catalyst for you to write this piece? Damn, that's some really good writing. Uh, so this has been a discussion. <laughs> this has been a discussion that has been going on, um, kind of in elite spheres, academia, and the culture industry, sort of elite culture industry more broadly since Trump, really since he was elected. Although it came a little bit before, which is whether or not to diagnose Trumpism as fascism, and what that means. And I think. Um, we could get into a conversation, but people might be asking, why is this important? Certainly not the most important uh, thing, but it's an interesting discussion because I think it has an analytical side and a political side. So I would argue that identifying Trumpism or identifying a, a, an American fascism, which in my opinion never really existed, is just analytically incorrect because there's not enough meaningfully similar between the 2023 United States and what most people think about when they use the term fascist and that's Nazi Germany. So things are so dissimilar analytically employing the term might actually seek, uh, lead us to seek solutions in the wrong places. Uh, and then politically, uh, the, it's just a question, do people care about this on a meaningful level? I don't think that's been borne out by the um, history. So, yeah, so that's basically the long and short of it. So, Danny, I wanted to ask you, you know, I found this article very interesting. Um, <laughs> and I like the historical perspective that you were uh, taking on it. Could you outline to our listeners a little bit about how the term fascism was received in the United States historically? Obviously, you know, sure. this article is written with like the, the post-2016, uh, like, uh, rising stock of the term fascism and political discourse, but could you talk a little bit about the history of it, of how it came sure. to in America? Yeah, so basically it's been a series of phases. So Mussolini renames his political party, I believe it's the National Fascist Party, it's 1921, and that, you know, it's a term that ha had existed associated with Mussolini's movement, really becomes more popular after that. For the first decade or so of its existence in the United States, I'm only referring to how it was received in uh, the U.S. The term fascism basically referred to Mussolini's Italy, and it wasn't used that much. Um, and some Americans actually admired some elements of Mussolini's Italy, the sort of powerful leaders, wielding executive Marcus authority. Marcus Right, yeah, many people, for progressive purposes. Um, in the 30s, uh, it becomes more of a free-floating signifier as people begin to associate Hitler and Mussolini in their minds. Um, of course, Mussolini preceded Hitler in power by a decade, um, but it's over the course of the 1930s that Hitler, who's the head of a more powerful state, who, who does more um, extravagant things, um, like past the Nuremberg laws in 1935, um, radicalizing in part Mussolini, who was always a radical, but they learned from each other. So this is Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia and, and um, whatnot. The term fascism becomes blended in the American imagination to refer to mostly Nazi Germany. Um, so it's a free floating signifier means something kind of bad in the 1930s. So you have FDR being called fascist. You have Huey Long being called fascist. You have Lindbergh being called fascist. You know, everyone's called fascist of different political persuasions. Uh, during World War II, the term basically refers to the Axis powers. There's a moment of stabilization. And here's where the interesting thing happens, I think, um, is that during and after World War II, uh, U.S. elites begin using the America, uh, the European, excuse me, the European political spectrum of left and right to understand their own politics. Actually, before World War II, American elites didn't really use the spectrum of left to right. They thought that their country had different political formations that were separate from the old world. This is, you know, 19th, early 20th century America. It's very much separating oneself from the, the pathologies of the old world. And it was only during and after World War II that Americans started using this framework mm -hmm. of left and right. In the US, there was a left, it was communist, but there wasn't really an identified right. A lot of things that we now associated with, associate with the right, like 
white supremacy was just part of normal politics, of course, in the United States. Um, and of course, it's, it's a part of normal politics to some degree today, too. Uh, but it, it becomes not a part of normal liberal politics during and after World War II. You get a type of racial liberalism, which many people have written about. So anyway, the welfare liberals uh, basically need to construct a political spectrum of left to right because they need to present themselves as moderates, the so-called vital center. And so what they do is they have already the communists on the left and they add the just defeated fascists in the process of being defeated fascists to the right. So there's this new political spectrum, which runs from left to uh, a communist on the left to fascists on the right. And that becomes to um, define how Americans understand their politics during and after World War II. It also, it doesn't quite align with the European political spectrum, which for most of its history, you have communists on the left and something like a monarchist on the right. It's only in the 20th century that fascists begins to displace monarchists. So anyway, fascists becomes um, a th thing against which liberals define themselves. So from roughly 45, 1945 to the mid-60s, fascism means something on the extreme right. Um, at, over the course of these decades, I would say liberal governance became institutionalized. And then in the mid to late 1960s, something happened, which is that the baby boomers who are anti-Vietnam War, um, who were aware of fascism, their parents oftentimes fought fascism. So they had grown up in its shadow but hadn't experienced it begin to use fascism as a kind of catch-all term word. You know, LBJ is fascist, Nixon is fascist. And, and so it's really in the 60s and 70s that fascism becomes decoupled from its association with the extreme right wing. Uh, and that, I think, remains relatively true until 2016. So over those 40 or so years, basically the course of baby boomers adulthood, uh, you have a fascism is a dirty word again, just like it was in the 1930s. Um, and then uh, after 2016, it becomes, uh, uh, so all what I just said, that's basically Bruce Kuplick's arguments. And where I advance it in the piece is argue that since 2016, it's actually become associated with the far right again, and that there's this new debate and what I argue is that it, this new debate is happening because liberalism is in crisis in a way that it's never been um, since the 1930s, again, when, when fascism first came on the American scene. So I have a, I have a kind of quick follow-up uh, question. So, you know, in terms of uh, discussing fascism as a phenomenon, you know, you talk about, obviously, today we don't have the kind of preconditions that existed uh, in Europe in the 1920s and 30s to create something that is meaningfully comparable to the fascist movements of Italy. So the the veterans, the the the, the type of economic yeah. crisis. The three structure. So I would argue that historical fascism in the 20s and the 30s had three structuring conditions. Mm -hmm. The first was the experience of total war by literal people on the front and people at home, mass starvation, you know, a huge amount of the population of men being killed and then the actual experience of devastating total war which a lot leads to men doing things like fighting in street gangs i don't think incels are comparable uh second you have what capital is what capital did during the 20s and the 30s particularly in germany uh and in italy too but germany had a more developed capitalist element to it um in my opinion uh it associated with the extreme right because of the crisis caused by the great depression and the emergence of a powerful left that actually threatened capitalism in a meaningful sense the way that i put it on another podcast was capital would prefer to align with liberalism if it had its choice um i think and it's only under extreme conditions when for example they could actually lose to the lefts that it aligns with an extreme right wing like fascist group so i, I don't think there's been a powerful left the left was just eradicated institutionally in the U.S. So what I, what I wanted to kind of ask just, just very quickly, final thing, because they go together, is that I don't think a state is able to be owned in the way that it was in the 20s and the 30s. I think the, the, the pure bureaucratic structures of states have changed over the course of the second half of the uh, 20th century and early 21st. Military power, but also like literally wielding a state apparatus, cannot be done in quite the same way that Hitler was able to do. You're not able to have a similar Gleichschaltung coordination process that Hitler was able to do because the state was much less sophisticated than it is today. So that's so just one kind of it's, it's a slight diversion but when i read your article i was thinking about it i mean what do you make of the arguments that for example the post-civil war movements in the united states such as the ku klux klan those kind of groups might be regarded as kind of proto-fascist uh movements I mean, whenever it comes to that, it really does seem like the valence of fascism is what's important there, that you're describing these things as as as, as evil as Nazi Germany. And I would agree with that moral conclusion. But 
I don't understand why we need to import a term which emerged in a very particular context to a moment that long preceded it, and that is uh, whose history I would say is our, uh, is 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 more closely tied to um, indigenous American traditions of racism and slavery and capitalism and white supremacy and all of those things. I don't understand what fascism gets you necessarily. It gets you the moral critique, but it doesn't get you much analytical purchase because how is a a term that was really used to describe a very peculiar movement in the 20s and 30s really what happened in post-reconstruction America it doesn't really make sense to me so so as so on this know. kind on this kind of like uh question of terminology you think from a let's say a scholarly perspective or from a uh, from the perspective of analytical utility it's best to just keep fascism to refer to these historical movements, as well as those movements that perhaps are the direct ideological and political inheritors of those traditions. Is that how I'm uh, understanding your Yeah, I don't think fascism, it's not like, it's different than liberalism and conservatism, which have much longer traditions. I mean, fascism is a species, if you're going to use a European spectrum, of like, right-wing conservatism and if you wanted to trace the origins of fascism you would trace it to things like pan-germanism and european catholic thought going back to augustine and, and their opinion of the jews and 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 things that were occurring in the germanic lands uh so i think you're not good that's not what caused the pro the ku klux klan or reconstruction in in the, in the same way you know it's not the legacy of um Augustine and, and the Catholic theology on the Jews or pan-Germanism that gave rise to the sort of American-centered white supremacy. Now there are rhymes, certainly this idea of supremacy mm -hmm. is in a comparative context useful to compare things like Reconstruction era, the US and uh, fascist Germany. They're, it's, they're, they're in a relatively coherent political moment and temporal moment, and you could learn from that. But to describe Reconstruction era U.S. as fascist to me doesn't make. Why would you do that? It doesn't give you anything analytically. In fact, so, so you know, back to your point about people calling, let's say, LBJ fascist. What what would make LBJ fascist? So Angela Davis um, refers to the the war in Vietnam as fascist, okay. um, and I think what she meant by that is that this is a truly evil. You know, it's equivalent to Hitler's invasion of France and Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes a way to identify something with a. It's a political. It's it's more of a political term than it is an analytical term. What becomes the difference between fascism and, and imperialism at that point? In in what sense? Oh, like, you mean like if you're comparing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one would argue this isn't what Davis argues. So I'm just talking generally now. I think one would argue that the 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 sort of rapacious elements of fascism were meaningfully similar to what LBJ was doing in Vietnam. I don't agree. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think they're like the motivations of Amer American imperial action in the 1960s are that much that that's similar to what Hitler was doing in his search for Lebensraum, except in so far that they are both expansionist. Um, but to me, I think it's, again, mostly a political moral term and not really an analytical one when people call it LBJ or Vietnam fascist. So I think that's like a, a you know, to kind of f follow up on that. I think that's a very important point, which, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I want to ask, as it's kind of hinted at in the article, but I don't think you, you know, fully go into the topic of it is you come to this conclusion that you know fascism is is largely a kind of term for things that we don't like politically and you give all these examples of people on, uh, on different parts of the political spectrum from the right to the left using fascism to denounce their uh, uh opponents as being fascist and all fascist comes to mean is super bad super evil something that we should <laughs> we should hate and in the context of 2016 there's this shift as it's a bit more than that it's also a way to identify oneself right you know as all political languages as, as you both know it's a form of castigation and a form of identification hello so so it's basically you are um <laughs> <laughs> we had a break we had a break and i didn't lock my door what i wanted to ask then is like what is the political role in self-definition 
<laughs> what is the political role in self-definition of uh, Democrats and the left in the in the okay. in, in the Trump era? Yeah. Okay, a couple things. So, uh, as I've argued elsewhere, I think we live in an, a moment of anti-popular politics. That's how I put it in the piece. And what I mean by that is that there are very few meaningful ways for ordinary people to meaningfully affect policy or what is actually done in this country. And I think many studies have shown that elite interests are listened to and public interests, the public opinion is not like a determining force of much policy. Um, however, at the same time, in the last 15 years in particular, um, the advent of social media has made people more political or at least more polarized in the sense that they identify with particular elements of the political spectrum. So you have a moment of extreme polarization, and particularly on social media, which is a lot of where this debate took place. And you have a moment of anti-popular, anti-mess politics. And so combined, you need to basically people need to give their political lives meaning if they're spending so much time and effort tweeting about it and getting mad and identifying about it. And so I think what they've done is constructed a struggle between fascists, like the most evil that one can imagine in the North Atlantic imagination in the 20th century, certainly, and themselves as good people. And I think um, that that's sort of the emotional part. And then the ideological part is that I would argue that we live again in a peculiar moment uh, and that uh, we live at the end of history in the sense that, as Fukuyama correctly said, and I have a piece coming out about this in The Nation, as Fukuyama correctly said, um, there have been no real ideological challenges to liberalism. In fact, I think we're enter entering a post-ideological moment. Like, I don't think China or Russia are promoting any particular ideology like the Soviet Union and the People's Republic was doing the Cold War. And unless you unless if you consider nationalism a form of ideology which it is but not in the same way that communism is they kind of run parallel um so i actually think we're entering a post-ideological age um so liberalism is in crisis for all of these reasons we're entering a post-ideological age they failed we just had the 20th anniversary of iraq after iraq you have the 08 recession you have the invasions of libya the the interventions in syria ukraine and then you have the general Ill illegitimacy of the system engendered by trump and engendered just by normal capitalist failures like uh, elizabeth um Homes and SBF and the failure of SVB. So liberalism is in crisis. So ideologically, in order to um, basically justify itself in a moment of crisis, it re-identifies fascism. Because as I talked about earlier in the 1940s, li modern liberalism comes into being defining two others, communism and fascism. Communism doesn't exist anymore. So you got fascism. We have a super chat here for you. Let me pop it up on the screen. Um, hello, is Damn. it up on the screen? It's okay. On the screen. Okay. I think we were both trying to do it. Um, this is from JB. <clears throat> what are Dr. Bessner's thoughts on a term like post-fascist and or the adjective fascistic and looking at capitalism post-1945? Fascistic tendencies in an absence of mass politics, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I'm not the the term police. Uh, <laughs> are you sure, sure that. Danny? Yeah. I, I've seen you on Twitter, and apparently, you are the term police. Make a better. Yeah, I mean, if you use the terms, just have a reason for them. You know, and, and someone asks why you use those terms. Uh, if the reason is just I wanted to point out that this <laughs> is bad, I would say not analytically <laughs> useful. So, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, I think it's I think it's an important point that you're making there because. I mean, the way I see the use of the term fascism, and I don't know if you would agree with me, Daniel, on this, but I see it, especially from the perspective of Democratic Party politics, as being a an umbrella in which a narrative has been weaved that links the United States domestic policy to its foreign policy, or rather the liberal iteration of what American empire should be doing uh, and the struggle at home unified in the figure of Vladimir Putin, who is both the external evil and also the puppet master behind all the fascists in the United mm. States, which creates this like anti-fascism as a discursive, as a discursive, um, uh, let's say catch-all term to use in a struggle against the Republican party uh, uh, at home in order to, like you say, guilt people into signing up to the democratic party because you know 
if you're not an anti-fascist, you must be a fascist. So it polar, it's like a form of it, It's interesting because the more the more prevalent discourse has been about defending democracy mm -hmm. as opposed to defeating fascism, because there isn't really a fascism out there to defeat. So this is why it's kind of funny, because you could still get the defending democracy message, which I think, um, or at least polls, who knows how accurate they are, but polls suggest was actually effective in the midterms. I think you could get the defending democracy message if that's what you're concerned with without the fascism thing. The fascism well, isn't that, is it, but isn't that the, the signifier that is used, especially in, in contemporary U.S. politics. I don't think it's actually used that much. I think it's, you have it's, to stop, but the stopping the fasc, quote unquote, the fascism of the GOP. It's used a little bit, but it, I, defending democracy is just more prevalent. It, it's it's more about like defending the beauty of America than it is about defeating an external enemy. Is uh, there a fear? Trump is identified as fascist in that, but even then, it's more like the message is still more important of defending. Do you, Do you think that there's a fear then of saying that? there is a U.S. fascism on the rise from, a, I mean, talking from mainstream political pundits, and I mean from this small corner of the internet. Wait, I don't understand. Uh, because you're saying that you're hearing more defending democracy. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. And really like, hear and like the Times, you know, the Times is not defending, the Times is much more about defending democracy than it is about defeating fascism, even though it has some of that. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're, they're yeah. So do you think that there, people don't want to say that there is a fascistic element uh, to the right, because that's the whole thing about Trump and uh, even a lot of the uh, abortion bills that have been coming out over the last year is that this is this is modern fascism coming down from the GOP and we have to stop the fascist GOP. And you're saying I that, think people want to yeah. want to use it. But I, I just don't think um, it, do, it It actually seems like they, they don't use fascism that much, like the mainstream liberal, like popular press they use it sometimes but it's really like the world of ideas like the ann applebaums of the world like the atlantic like this is this is a debate really for the elite mm -hmm. i don't think it's really permeated much mm -hmm. of popular discourse uh it's really like various elites like left-wing elites like me fighting against like liberal elites mostly associated with large cultural institutions or universities it's a very like here's a, here's a we don't have you very long here's a dumb question why is everyone so upset about not being able to use the word fascism? I mean, they can use whatever word they want. You've never said in the piece, if you use this word, you know, the, the Stasi's watching you and we're going to. They, they want to imagine that they're like heroes of history where we're all just denuded, alienated, neoliberal or post neoliberal subjects. We're not our great grandfathers like fighting in the in, not the trenches fighting in the ardennes during the battle of the bulge or whatnot we're all sitting on our computers yelling at each other and retweeting each other it's depressing so they're giving a narrative to their own lives that's more meaningful that's what I, I, th I think i think there's i think there's very much something to that i remember listening to uh, msnbc during the trump years and, you know, these guys were like, at, you know, they were calling themselves the resistance, yeah, which is obviously an allude. It's like the bourgeoisie, if you want to put it that way, is like trying to relive the fantasies of the past. Like it's heroic phase in history when it's just kind of just like slopping around. Well, also, your fucking computer screen. What gave rise to fascism was like terror and death of four years on the fucking Western front. You know, like there's no the incels are not fascists. We're all just depressed, alienated. <laughs> my friend aren't you a veteran of the twitter wars the twitter wars you know yeah i'm a veteran of the culture wars that's what yeah, I'm i mean a look, it's dude, so ridiculous you, i mean it's danny like, you know I, I wrote that i wrote that piece you know that is the is a contemporary left uh, a, a oh, yeah, lifestyle brand and uh you know people got very upset about that and i i felt the same way and i'm like wow i'm glad i'm not as popular as danny bessner because you know <laughs> it's like every day i see your i see your name in on twitter and it's somebody like really writing a whole piece trying to excoriate you for for something that seems yeah what 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 about it hit them emotionally to yeah like I, I guess that's what I'm, i feel like what you're saying a day writing a piece it's that element I, yeah, of, what, of course that's I feel what you're saying because i've been reading i, I reread your piece in harper's again before I wrote something and I'm working on something else. And piece. then I read this and I remember when Ben was, you know, we were talking about this a few weeks before it hit. 
And it really resonated with me because I've, I've, and I was talking, Conan's here, by the way. Conan Neutron's here. We were having this conversation. Danny says, what's up? I think he's doing some music stuff in the room. Um, and it feels like a lot of this stuff is kind of like the cries of the defeated. Like you're taking my words away. And, and there's there's something to be said about the non-existence of the left, which we always say on the show, we don't have a left, we have leftists. The need to feel like you need to have an anti-fascist movement, which really just goes out and tries to protect peaceful protesters against you know, shitty dudes. Yeah, but I mean, like, I'm not against any of that. I mean, it's just, but it's not even a problem of the left because like all of those institutions don't exist anymore. Yeah. In like the 19, I'm writing another piece that's supposed to come out on Monday about like the de-docker de-democratization of the U u.s like in the 1920s i think the statistic is there were for every thousand people there were four different voluntary associations you know mm -hmm. none of that shit exists anymore so we're all just like totally hyper alienated subjects um and that hyper alienation reflects itself differently in different people with different experiences but i just think like fundamentally we live in a more alienated society than we did 100 years ago we don't live in a moment of mass politics that could engender something like fascism uh, but it does engender things like angry Twitter retweets uh, and things like that. You know, that becomes a lot of social interaction. Of course, like all of us, we get that dopamine. In. Um, but, but what do you feel? How, how do you feel about an older generation of, of new left people? Like we had Norm Finkelstein on the other day. And I feel like there's an older generation of Americans that really feel. And maybe they did overuse the term in their day to the point about Angela Davis. Norm. Did, did Finkelstein say like we're on the verge of like a right wing extremist? Um, I think there's a real fear that they got during Trump because he's such a cartoon figure <laughs> and seeing such a cartoon figure into the White House so quickly before it took time for the cartoon I mean, figures. To get at, to levels George of power. W. Bush was horrible. Uh, you know, time for Bush to get horrible. To power. Reagan time. was horrible. What are they yes. even talking about? It's so ridiculous. I, I'm agreeing, but I'm saying my point is that it, there was still a process to him to get to that point. He didn't fuck up and not go to Vietnam and come coked out and walk right onto the White House steps. He had to fuck up as governor of Texas first, botch being the owner of the Rangers. You know, there was a lot of things he got to do before he got into office that are like these signifiers of, okay, well, you did the things, right? And Trump is almost like a skit from Saturday Night Live coming to life. It's a well, Twilight it's Zone. It's a different political time. moment. I mean, like people like who believe that had some sort of reverence for the system ultimately. I mean, mm -hmm. if they truly believed what they said, they would realize this is a disgusting system for clowns. So why wouldn't a clown embody it? It's just, we live in an age of no subtext any longer, but that's the postmodern age. Right. Everyone knows it's bullshit. Like, just like I say this all the time, everyone knows JFK was killed by someone. It doesn't fucking matter. That's the thing. Right. It doesn't matter. It's just the, the, the empire. Now the empire has a senescent 80 year old. Is that so much better than Trump? I mean, they're both two sides of the same coin. I don't I just do not get this argument. You don't like comp up. Come on, man. <laughs> don't like comp up, Danny. Danny's Comp very anti corn pop. Is, he's, fight, he's fighting fascism. For, I mean, I, I, you know, I agree. I agree a lot with Danny. I mean, like, I see in other parts of the world, I see movements that have more fascistic elements. And what I mean by fascistic is they have uh, institutions or discourse which echoes that of the, you know, of, of fascism. See, here's the question always How is it different from authoritarianism? But yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the point I was going to come to. It's like at the end of the day, you know, I like for liberalism, you know, communism, fascism, and liberalism are the kind of like silos of politics, right? But, but fascism isn't really a silo of politics. Exactly. It hasn't been like there used to be fascist philosophers. Like in the 30s, there were all these Germans who were writing like fascist philosophy and engaging with like Burke and all of, all of those people. And that hasn't existed for 70 years because it was defeated materially. You're Mar we're all Marxists, right? It was materially defeated. If that didn't happen, we would live in a different situation where, where there would be all these philosophers and it would be a live ideological movement. And, it, you know, there's a, the word cold war, I believe this is correct, was actually developed to talk about the U S fighting with Nazi Germany. So there's a world where, you know, it remains a coherent ideology and becomes associated with states. We just don't live in that world. So I don't understand what it gets you. I mean, it strikes me as just like, it's a variety of reactionary politics. Yeah. 
and you can and I is mean, there like, right wing populism, guys? I'm asking the question. I don't know the answer. Is there right wing populism? Then? I mean, that. the I problem mean, is again. The problem with this is my exact point. In the U.S., there couldn't have been a right wing populism because people weren't referring to the right when populism was a thing. So over the course of the 20th century, these American political movements get sort of placed on a political spectrum that doesn't quite make sense for the U.S. context of running from left to communist to right monarchist and later fascist. It doesn't make sense, right? The progressive movement doesn't map onto left and right. The populist movement doesn't map onto left and right. It's not the same thing. So that's why there's all this confusion. It's sloppy terminology oftentimes engenders confused and sloppy thinking. I have a question. Um, I had some tech issues uh, briefly. I'm not sure if you covered this. Uh, where would you um, categorize the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and January 6th? They're on Any the right. They're, they're a particular American flavor of the reactionary right uh, that has not existed. not fascist. No, that, that goes back to, well, to the founding of this country, of <laughs> gang, gangs of white men trying to reinforce racial supremacy. Um, I mean, that has a long American history. Uh, it's profoundly American. Uh, I, as I put in my piece, I forget the exact phrasing, but like genocidal militarism, xenophobia, a, a violent obsession with incarcerating minorities were not fascist inventions. They have a real deep history in this country. We, and we don't need to import a term from interwar Germany to condemn and be disgusted at that history. It's American as apple pie. We don't need a term used to describe Europe to describe what happens here. So you don't have a term, is what you're saying. The reaction you don't have a, a nice right. pithy term to replace fascist for me. American. American. <laughs> American. Well, American reaction. Yeah. White right. American reaction. <laughs> but da Danny, I think we, I think we're coming up against a hard yes. out for you. But uh, I want to thank you for writing your article because I know you've yes, been so in the much. fascism. You've been in the fascism war for a while, actually. This is not the, your first uh, foray into the fascism debate, and you did trigger a Jonathan Chait article, so I would like to... Can I just say one thing? Because I think this is an important point. Um, people bring up the James Q. Whitman book, which is a comparative law book about how Nazi Germans um, jurists mm -hmm. and American jurists learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Um if you're trying to identify what caused the Holocaust or what caused Nazism, um, I don't think U.S. influence is a, an especially important causal force in what led to Nazism and the Holocaust. And I actually think that claim, which is oftentimes overstated, um, not by Whitman, I might add, or the scholars who have examined these various exchanges, but in popular discourse, um, I think that that claim uh, actually invinces a form of what I term negative American exceptionalism. So instead of America being exceptionally great, it's the cause of all the world's ills. And again, I just think that flat out distorts the history of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Sorry, Gene. Uh, no, I I, uh, I certainly agree with you. I agree with your point on that. I mean... You know, I, I, I we're probably going to dive a little deeper into that uh, negative American exceptionalism, which is, you know, kind of a bit of a problem. Which oh, I, do, I, I do. I do need to read a book. I've read many books, too many books. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the point about the uh, connections between Nazi Germany and the American, you know, systems. I mean, yeah, Nazi Germany did draw on aspects of the American story american imperial expansion to frame itself but those were ultimately the importation of tools to execute a project rather than the cause of that project you know if that and makes I think sense. there's a lot of things happening in the 30s in particular where the new deal and the nazi german program and the italian german program there's like a common international framework of ideas that people are using that are circulating going back to colonialism right of course uh, of course, those, those are ideas that are circulating. But I think what, what actually happens, it, it winds up being Americans placing themselves at the center of everything. Um, the world, the greatest good and the worst evil. 
Uh, and again, it's about as a historian, you're supposed to construct ho causal hierarchy. And Gene, in general, you know, I think the transnational stuff has been overblown. Uh, I think it's an artifact of the 90s globalization movement. Um, and I've written scholarly articles about this. So in some sense, it relates to that. Like these are all books emerging from a particular term in historiography, turn in historiography that de-emphasizes nations and emphasizes international circuits and transnational exchanges. And, and I think in actuality, I would say, in the, in, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, people really did live national lives. Um, and I think that we have gone too far away from that reality. But yeah. <laughs> well, Danny, it's been beautiful. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for joining guys. us. Talk to you later. He's Danny Bessner, there, wherever you are watching or listening to the show, there are links in the description. Definitely links in the chat to the article. Give it a read. Danny says he loves it when you reply to him on Twitter with your opinions oh. about the piece. Yeah, Danny does oh. love everybody's opinions. In all he's caps. Like the, he's the Sith Lord of Twitter. He's uh it's it's like a <laughs> strike me down with all of your hate. And I will and I will only become stronger. I, and and I think people are kind of missing a point because I'm seeing a lot of like silly stuff in the chat. And uh also please uh i'll say this one time don't ever tell me to put somebody on the show that you want on the show because a why do you think i have that power to get that person b if you don't know that person don't tell me to get them on the show like i i'm not the most connected man in america and it's really hard to get big time people on the show and if you're mad that uh you're not hearing your point echoed I'm sorry. That's just the way things are. Sometimes we can't be a constant sharing section for everyone where you can just hear what you want to hear and and, uh, and touch yourself to it. That being said. Oh, you said you knew Basquiat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Zal, what do you have to say about all this? What do you think about what do you think about the bourgeoisie? The bourgeoisie. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to do to them? Want to do but it was boring. Okay, so Zal Zal's gone all shy now, so he didn't <laughs> he didn't he doesn't want to tell you. It's probably because he can't hear anybody because I have headphones on. Ah, uh, that's, that's why he was it. mad. But you know, Gene, you were talking the other day um, yes. about Zal. If you interrupt me one more time, I will walk <laughs> to Springfield and take away all of your toys. We have a super chat for you, Jason. Yes. This is to help you to remain in good standing with your kids fund. Thank you very much. Denzo Stray Dogs. For, for those that don't know, I was I was accosted by the police here in Mexico and shaken down for quite a bit of money. Not a good time. Appreciate it. Anyway. I'm gonna talk about fascism. <laughs> <laughs> but Jason, so so yeah, go ahead. I'll, I will no, 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 no. So, go ahead, Gene. So what you gonna say? No, you were gonna say something. You. I wasn't gonna say anything. Go ahead. You go. We're totally gonna say. Said something. so, Jason. So say it. So, no, say what you were gonna say. Oh my God! There's two Zals on the screen, and one is older than four. So I need you to say oh, what you were gonna say. What? No, I, I mean, I, I find, but what I would say is, I would say about Danny's article, I find his kind of discussion of fascism um, refreshing. I don't know how yeah. far I would go with saying there's no utility to discussing, for example, fascistic elements of particular of discourse, of you know, uh, of um, types of political organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would have to think about that question more. But in general, I think he, he his critique of this use of fascism is useful because a lot of the discourse about American politics is so hyperbolic, and yet it, the 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 change mm -hmm. for the vast majority of people, I'm not saying all people, you know. The change between a Republican and Democratic administration, it's not that big for most people. You know, there are people who are going to be definitely affected. Right? <laughs> I never see that big of a difference. It's like at all. It's like, you know, what's the difference? It's not affecting. For some people, I'm not 
dismissing that for certain communities and certain groups, there may actually be a con a big difference. Although it's not really doesn't it's not really national politics with all this trans right stuff. That's state governments doing like pretty horrible things to trans people, right? So yeah, there is a kind of stake on the ground there. But on the national level, like Trump was in power, all these national elites were super triggered. But honestly, like. On a day-to-day -day basis, my job didn't change during this period. Mm. My job, my job hasn't changed under Biden. I don't get. I briefly got slightly more benefits with that child's tax credit at the beginning, but you know, I got some dollars from. I got Trump bucks, if you remember. <laughs> I got some Biden money. because you only spend them at one place, like Company Town money. <laughs> no, I think that would be cool. <laughs> but um, um, but yeah. Do you think Americans have a hard time kind of trying to define fascism because um, we think we see it and we don't really see like super oppressive governments like, I don't know, the Philippines under Duterte, you know, killing people left and right? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, like, yeah, we, see, I mean, there's all kinds of things happening all the time, but you know, whether it's the left or the right flank of, you know, the ca capitalist politics, mm -hmm. someone's getting stomped on in the end. Right? Someone's definitely getting stomped on in the end. Someone's, like, oh. even with, like, you know, with the, the Republicans and the Democrats, like mm -hmm. both of them in their own way, are fighting, you know, quote unquote free speech wars, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know the Democrats are doing their thing to stop hate speech and misinformation, as they call it, and the Republicans are doing their thing to like. I mean, I read an article today where they were like upset that some kids had seen David's Michelangelo because obviously his mm -hmm. ding dong, his bing bong is out, but. But you know, like whatever. It's like it was in Florida. They don't like bing bongs in Florida. Well, who was it that was trying to cut? I don't know if you remember this, Gene. You might. You were definitely weren't in the states when this happened. Maybe Tucson remembers it. What senator was trying to cover up the statue of David or oh, Lady Justice? Oh no, that was uh, that was the that was uh, God. What was the George Bush's? Oh um, God, I can't think of the name. Someone watching the show right now knows this person. Attorney General. His he had like a. Once he he had uh, he had an attorney general who was maybe Mexican or some kind of Spanish. Uh, <laughs> God damn! I, uh, I can't remember what his name. Uh, he had he had a uh, Latin name. Um, no, he didn't have a Latin name. Do you remember this? If, if Pascal was here, he knew. He probably know, but I'm sure yeah, it was, yeah, that was it John Ashcroft? Ashcroft. Was it John Ashcroft? No, it wasn't Ashcroft. No, it wasn't Ashcroft. I've met John Ashcroft. He's he comes to Springfield. He's from Aww. Missouri. He's a he, he. He. I went Gene to the daughters. Me, Sarah, Zal. We went to the <laughs> Daughters of the American Revolution ice cream Jeez. social. Uh, Sarah is, as people may know, a daughter of the American Revolution. She's also <laughs> daughter, she's also a daughter of the Iranian Revolution too. So Does she fight herself sometimes. <laughs> no, it's like a <laughs> historical progression, right? So, um, <laughs> So we went to the ice cream social and we met John Ascroft, who was smoozing with the old ladies, who were very nice. Who were very nice. Um, before, before, before we before we head out, uh, I do want you to talk a little bit about this inverted American uh, exceptionalism that Danny kind of hits on, and you definitely hit on a little bit last night. Yeah, I mean, like, look, the I appreciate people being critical about you know the American political history, political tradition. I'm not at all, you know, romantic or starry eyed about any of these things. And I think there is a kind of, you know, a historical narrative, which is like, I think is out of fashion now. Right. Mm -hmm. But a historical used to be narrative where like America was the best. And, you know, if we did something bad, you know, it was a mistake. It wasn't anything to do with us, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's a kind of overcorrection in that where the entire world and all the bad things in the world are a product of the United States. And Danny hinted at it. It's like 
you know, you go on Twitter and you'll see people uh, point out that Whitman book about the connections between Nazi Germany and the American legal establishment, and in particular, you know, the legal establishment in the southern states. And they would they'll point to that saying, look, even the Nazis, who are the baddest of the bad people, they, they're actually a creation of the United States as well. And I think this is kind of a weird inversion of American exceptionalism, where, you know, instead of seeing America as a, you know, the indispensable nation, the good guy, America mm. is the is is the bad guy in everything and is you know is is the world's only evil and all evil in the world has to be rooted in the united states and you know that's not to say that you know american imperial power or the policies of the american state haven't been brutal in different parts of the world but you know if you reduce everything to like america's behind it all you end up with a kind of very conspiratorial and childish understanding of the world, which makes it difficult for you to understand what the heck is going on. Because, you know, sometimes there are things in the world that the United States is influencing. Sometimes there isn't, right? You know, sometimes America is like not at the center of everything. So there's a kind of, it's a kind of egotism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, it's... It reduces America to like an inversion of this kind of America, the innocent to America, like the particularly evil. And, you know, the problem with American imperial power is not that America is particularly more evil than anybody else. It's just that it happens to be the largest, most powerful capitalist country in the world, a position that it got in many ways, largely because all its other competitors in that field like imploded in the first and second world war and it was like the only one standing at the end right mm -hmm. well let me let me ask you since you are a historian what is wrong with that analysis because people love uh holding on to the whole hitler stole everything from america is it just not factually true i know we'll get to it i need a gene to answer this sure. i mean you know i'm not an expert on the origins of nazi germany and fascism so you know take what I say with a kind of like grain of salt. This is kind of my impression of the field is that obviously there are connections uh, between the development of fascism and the political projects that had taken place during the 19th century, which include the United States as a kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 a state that was expanding, settling, displacing, genociding people. Uh, across North America, but you know who else? Also, the experience of Britain, France, the experience of German colonialism in Africa. You know, like there's like very strong linkages and connections between the German administration in Southwest Africa. Uh, what so you're saying it? Hitler didn't get a pamphlet, is what you're saying? He did. He, did, he, did, he didn't get a pamphlet. pamphlet. I mean, you know, he used analogies from the United States, like we're going to do to the Russians what the Americans did to the Native Americans. Sure, you know, no doubt about that. But that, because that language and that uh, stuff was imported from the United States, that doesn't mean that that was like, if it wasn't for America, you know, the Nazis would never have thought of all this stuff. You know, no, there's like, it's a complicated global world that, we're, that we were living in. Um, and, you know, the Nazis drew on a lot of different political traditions to formulate their hodgepodge of ideology, including certain aspects, certain unsavory aspects of the American political tradition, specifically that settler colonial aspect and the kind of elimination of indigenous peoples, and also the long history in the United States of, you know, racialized legal codes, right? But, you know, that's not the only thing. I mean, like they didn't take other aspects of the American tradition, uh, such as like the Bill of Rights that might have been kind of cool, you know, you know. <laughs> so, you know, well, that wasn't in his pamphlet. It wasn't in his pamphlet. He didn't get the Bill of Rights. He didn't get the whole Bill of Rights thing in his in his uh, in his how to be a fascist pamphlet. There were no Ikea instructions for him. There were no Ikea instructions. 
that's kind of how that narrative goes that the America is the IKEA instructions. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, uh, where do I put the gas chamber? Like, so yeah. it's all uh there's some super chats. There are some super chats. Mm, we'll see what you guys have to say about them. This is from Omar. Is it useful to also make a distinction between fascism and Nazism? That's I believe Bessner huh? addresses doesn't uh Bessner address that in his article? Yes, he does. In his piece? Yeah. Well, so listen. The do piece, the readings. Do the readings. Do the readings. Do the readings. <laughs> no, what how do you feel about that question, Tucson? Well, I think that Bessner's piece, um, it kind of shows that fascism is a word that tends to obscure rather than clarify. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, it's not really useful. Nazi, he talks about Nazism in the case of, you know, Nazi Germany and how in that context we can talk about fascism, but it's not necessarily applicable to anything happening in the United States. I honestly feel like MT, and I don't know how you feel about this. Mm -hmm. I feel, especially on the left, perhaps not in the mainstream, but especially on the left, um, fascism is so often used as like a, a cudgel to like force you into voting for the Democrats, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, maybe you could convince me to the fucking vote for the Democrats for like some reason, but like, Come on, man. Don't give me that bullshit like you're fighting fascism reason. Well, you know, there is something interesting that Danny says about that because the liberal fascism book comes out in like, what, 2005? And then it is around the same time that Chris Hedges writes his, you know, Christian fascist book about the about the right. Um, it's like that Spider-Man meme where Spider-Man's pointing to this one. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man meme. I mean, it's like, look, uh, look at the war in the Ukraine, right? Or in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You have, like, not everybody in Ukraine fighting the Russians is a fascist, but you do have groups that have, like, a direct lineage that links them to the Banderas groups, which were, like, the pro-Nazi, uh, uh, you know, groups that joined the Germans in the invasion of the Soviet Union. But at the same time, if you look on the Russian side, you have like the most like quote unquote fascistic elements as well. Things like the Chechen Islamists, Wagner groups, groups that see themselves as the inheritors of like the black hundreds, like these kind of pre, you know, thing civil war. So, you know, you often just have like kind of, it's like confusing. Like ultimately at the end of the day, the left right spectrum, I guess is like a spectrum that, creates a meta narrative of politics that is one that's shaped by i guess capitalist politics right mm. you know you have the left and the right and there's the center and etc you know and then there's these extremes and i think ultimately on the left i suppose we have to break that because you know if we have that left right narrative then we've got these, we've got the quote unquote left flank of capital who we just assume are more likely to be our natural allies. But perhaps neither the left or the right flank of capital is our friend deep down. And perhaps we need to stop looking at politics according to this left right spectrum where you have like communists on the left, fascists on the right, and look at it in a different way where you have capitalist politics and you have socialist politics. And there are different flavors of capitalist politics and the capitalists probably prefer the liberal flavor, but they will return, they will resort to the more violent and fascistic elements if they can. So maybe the problem is just the way that we view political spectrums and what politics is and the, the kind of terminology, the meta terminology we use to understand the world even when we try and break away from it. But I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's there will tell us in his next article. Well, thank you very much for that super chat. Was that JB? That was Omar. Omar. Thank you very much, Omar. Appreciate that. Is that the last one or is there more? We've got one more. 
I oh, caught, no. well, this is what I caught. I don't believe there are more after this, but um, uh, let me put this on the screen. This is from Sean McCallum. This one is for Jason. Trump will be extremely dangerous if he goes down the national chauvinist dirigism welfare capitalism road. That would probably be it for the left. I don't think Trump has enough. <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I don't think they can do that actually, because they're just like, it's, you know, I, I think, think there there's some too people many people that don't want to see him empowered that would let him have any sort of major. He's too lazy, right? Like Trump is like personally too, just, just too lazy to do it, right? It's like if Trump, like this is my theory, right? If Trump did one kind of like quote unquote left wing policy, like one big ticket left wing policy, like no yeah, more college debt, you know. Okay. You know, no more college debt, or I don't know, um, you know, free health care, right? He was like, you know, yeah. we're gonna do Trump care. Everybody gets Trump care, and you get a picture of me on your Trump care card, and you <laughs> go to the hospital and you get Trump care, right? So only thing, everything else, same, right? Capitalists, you know, maybe some of them won't like free healthcare, but some of them are going to like it because they're like, you know what? Now I don't have to pay for those goddamn insurance for my workers. You know, that's, you know, maybe I lose a bit, but whatever. So they do one big ticket, quote unquote, left thing. Uh, they would have freaking wiped out the Dems for a generation, right? Just all they need to do is one thing, but they've got too much of that wacky, uh, they've got too much of that wacky, tobacco. Uh, you no know, wacky libertarian brand where they're like you know uh, like they just they're just not very good at doing it like they need to be better at bribing the population you know they need, they're not very good right wing populists they're not really good with their capitalist reforms yeah like you you got to be smart right um but uh yeah so like i don't think trump's going to go down this kind of welfare capitalism kind of stuff because i just don't yeah. think he's just like who's going to do it there isn't the cadre for him to do it who's he going to get to help him in this project it's the same problem with bernie like at the end of the day you know in retrospect bernie gets to the white house now there was the whole idea well bernie in the white house is going to be like this jumping off point maybe that would have worked i don't know but ultimately he wouldn't have got shit done bernie couldn't have got anything done with it like even if they had like a majority in the congress Let's say they have like a two, three Senate majority, you know, 10 seats in the House. No, you know, like they wouldn't pass anything. No Republicans going to support him. And half the Democrats are going to stab him back. Look what happened to Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party. You know, he was, you know, he wasn't done in by like the knife wasn't driven in by the Tory press or or the Jews, as people like to blame it. Right. The knife was driven in by the Labour Party, you know, the members of the, like, the apparatus of the Labour Party, right. MPs, the bureaucracy, who hated Corbyn, and they did him in, and they used whatever tools that they could get in their hands to do that. Hence, they, mm -hmm. like, when anti-Semitism was convenient, they used that to get him down, you know, after 20, uh, you know, after uh, 2017. So, you know, you know, Trump and Sanders are going to be the victims of their own party, <laughs> Uh, more than anything at the end of the day. Because look at them. They're trying to get that Ron DeSantis elected. And he's just not ready for prime time. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Varn where he says the GOP is willing to to lose a round just to make sure that there's no Trump. Just to make sure there's no Trump? Yeah. Yeah. But I do think we're going to see two governors go at it for the first time in, like, what, 20 years? Yeah. Do you think um, mainstream media is going to try it again? Try nope. to get him some free press? Nope. And... Nope. nope. Not going to nope. try it again. It's, it's not. It's nope. not worth it. Is Do you see it now? Not that I'm into mainstream media, but no. I mean, look, this we live in an echo chamber of mainstream media. Yeah. Let's be honest. Most of, these, most of these shows are people talking about people talking about the news. So, no one's talking about Donald Trump. I miss Donald Trump. I miss his tweets. 
I wish they would bring him back on. Get Twitter. ready for a very boring election cycle in 2024 because it's, it's going to be two governors. Um, that Toussaint calls cartoon mayors. Cartoon mayors, that's him. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Well, DeSantis looks like the mayor from, the corrupt mayor from The Simpsons. He does and look, does, yes. And who does, and who does uh, uh, Gavin Newsom look like? Gavin Newsom looks like a mayor or a governor from the animated series on Batman. <laughs> That's perfect, MJ. That's somebody, <laughs> somebody with artistic skills needs to draw that. And and I, and I thought Gavin Newsom was going to try to have a little bit more realistic signature policy, but I I read in the paper the other day that he is turning San Quentin into a rehabilitation facility, much like the ones in the Nordic countries. They're going to do yoga. Yeah. Look, man. Meditate. We all need rehabilitation from time to time. Zal is rehabilitating himself on the bed right there. I don't mm -hmm. Rehabilitate my foot in his behind. <laughs> <laughs> Zal, Zal just wanted to come and see Jason Miles, actually. That's what he came and told me. He's like, is this Jason Miles? Can I say hi to you? Because when he sees you on YouTube sometimes, mm -hmm. if I if I turn on TIR, he thinks mm -hmm. you're there and he starts talking to you. And it's like, that's he's, he's not going to reply. Don't make me sad. He's like, he's like hi, Jason Miles. And and, and uh, he's waiting for you to reply. And he's like, uh, is that Jason Miles? But then sometimes he gets angry because it's like, he's like, I don't want to watch Jason Miles. I want to watch Ben and I want to watch Ben and Holly. And it's like, okay, you can watch Ben and Holly, which is like a new version of Pepper the Pig. Is yeah, it? Yeah, it's like it's the same people who made Pepper the Pig, but it's about oh. fairies living in a garden. And oh. um, there's, you know, it's pretty good. I'm watching it. I'm enjoying it. Sitting there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Zal, Zal, does, Zal does sing songs. He sings Darling Nikki. Um, oh. Is that a different Darling Nikki? Like it's uh, a, like a. He likes dancing. Oh, speaking of songs for children. I found this Hotep dude that was talking about how Old McDonald is a is a racist song. It's about it white supremacy. Did I show you that video, Tucson? Mm -hmm. No. Where he goes E I E I fifth letter sixth letter, and he starts going six six E I E I. You ever seen that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was a real thing. It wasn't like a joke. Oh my gosh. That sounds pretty good. Maybe I should give Zal a good hotep education. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, young brother. Let me hip you to the game. Let me give you the math. When they say E I E I O, what they really saying is the white man is Satan. <laughs> for you, That's what it is. Well, that is the general editorial line of uh, TIR, right? That the white man is... The, the white man is <laughs> Well, you know, that was the best, that was the best uh, Pascal moment when he said, look, what, you know, broke my black nationalism was like, it wasn't that I liked white people more, I just discovered I hated black people as, just as much. What broke it was a white woman named Bethany. Woo! I made that up. That's slander, that. slander there. I am. I'm, I'm envisaging. I'm envisaging uh, Bethany right now. <laughs> Rosy red cheeks. Yeah, it was. It was 1994. You know, Bethany 195 had, pounds. She she had kind of baggy pants on, with a little sports bra top with a with the uh, with the plaid shirt over it. The big baggy plaid shirt. She was singing SWV. Don't walk away, boy. <laughs> David, can I do this one? Was she doing this one? <laughs> That's way too detailed. That's, I think, Jason, you're telling on yourself right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've never been to Bethany, as What's you've seen with my children. <laughs> There's been no Bethany's. No Bethany's. No Bethany's. Okay, fair There's enough. Been some Mary Queen De La Cruz's, but there's never been a Bethany. <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. If her. If uh, <laughs> her forefathers weren't conquered by the Spanish, Jason Miles isn't interested. <laughs> He's choking. 
They call him the Black Conquistador. <laughs> El Cid. <laughs> the Morisco. That's uh, that's what that's that's totally Jason Miles' uh, thing right there. That's mean. You guys are mean. Oh, you mean, but also factually accurate. So <laughs> <laughs> factually accurate. I mean, what do you say, MT? I'm a, I'm a lion. Where's the lie? I agree. <laughs> Bethany Applebaum. Somebody wrote Bethany <laughs> Applebaum. Cute. Pascal's going to turn on his computer and be like, what is all this Bethany shit on my Twitter? <laughs> People are just tweet tweeting at him, Bethany. No. <laughs> the people the people that made the pictures of Pascal with the parasol and the mint julep that was awesome you guys are the real MVPs <laughs> somebody did an AI picture Pascal looked like Aaron Hall from Guy <laughs> my name is business on a very nice beach <laughs> A parasol and a mint julep. Because he has to maintain his light skin privilege. Just talking like a slave owner. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I knew I could no longer be a black man. <laughs> <laughs> the mint juleps were too good. <laughs> mint juleps are pretty good, though. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So speaking of speaking of white devils, the white devils all just walked in and started getting loud in my living room. Oh, How many white devils are in there? There's two. Yeah. There's Conan Neutron. Conan and Ben. Ben is not a white devil. He's uh he's uh he's Jewish, which I believe is not white. Or is it white? I don't know. Is it's Jewish dead. white? I don't know, man. I think he's I think he according to everyone here, yes, he's white. He makes he makes bagels. Oh yeah, he makes bagels. That's very Jewish. <laughs> ben is decidedly not white, but I also enjoy telling white people they're not white. So, just as like a gift to them, just fun. Yeah, like on the bus. Well, I've told that's like my the most Irish woman ever. <laughs> the funniest thing I always find is like, you know, for a uh, for like a hundred years of Kurdish intellectual history. Like mm -hmm. all the Kurdish intellectuals are out there going, like Kurds are a member of the Aryan race. We're Indo-European people. We're part of the white race. And then boom, suddenly there's a few minority set aside jobs in uh, in, in university departments, and all of a sudden, the motherfucking people of color. It's like, since when did that fucking happen? Come on, guys. <laughs> and, and then I've got people going, like, I was oppressed by white supremacy because of my Iranian. I was like, what are you fucking talking about? Iranians like the same fucking color as you. What are you talking about? White supremacy. <laughs> you could just say he was an asshole. You know? <laughs> like most academics are. You don't need much more motivation than that. Well, did you read that? Was it the New York Times that had an article about another person that was lying about what they were? It was a black guy that was lying about being Cuban, being Afro Cuban. Yeah, there was no, there, you know what there is. We've talked about this ages ago, but uh, no, this is this is recent. There's another, a newer dude. No, no, but there was one mm -hmm. guy. I think I sent you the picture that Eskander, you know, my friend Eskander, mm -hmm. who's been on the show. He said, "Hey, check this guy out. Like, this guy is totally a white guy, but just take a look at him." And he's like, "Got dreads, and he's a, you know, like he's an academic." Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, we were yeah. like, "Let's get him on the show." And then, <laughs> ask, and then Jason and Pascal can like ask him point blank. Like a question that forces him to answer whether he's a white or a black guy. Like my favorite thing about Rachel Dolezal is when that dude asked her, she just went ah, ah, and just left. <laughs> <laughs> like, man. <laughs> well, you know, Ra Rachel Dolezal has a OnlyFans, and I think we should maybe set up a crowd uh, fundraising so to get Pascal a uh, a pass to that. Bethany. That's Bethany, right? That, that's the real Bethany. That's the real Bethany. Uh, 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 so there, there was Jessica Krug. There was, uh, well, you know, like 
it's but they, they're so there's the Jessica Krug lady was so bad because she she sounded like um what's that show Always Sunny where the woman does the yeah, the yeah. Puerto Rican thing like she sounded like basically what happened was she, she sound like they they used to be the company that made Thomas the Tank Engine <laughs> they made they made another series like based on the technology of Thomas the Tank Engine called Tugs right mm -hmm. and Tugs was shown in Britain. But it was actually meant for the American market. It was like set in the 1920s, and it, you know it had the, you know the faces. But instead of on trains, it was on ships, mm -hmm. and so it's like a 1920s port, which is basically New York with all these big tugboats, and like one of the recurring characters was a uh, was a smuggling tramp steamer called Izzy Gomez, who had <laughs> who had a who was like a big rusty ship with a sombrero on. And a droopy mustache, and that's literally where I learned like what a Mexican was was from this TV show. And he would like go, "Ay caramba, he's a ghost! Oh no, he's bananas! I am with me." It's like that was like you know that's it was like bro, you watch that now and you're like, I don't know, man. That's like yeah. <laughs> that's perhaps a little bit, a, bit, a little bit too. Uh, uh, I don't know, guys. I don't feel comfortable with this. You should. That's what exactly. that's what Jessica Krug sounded like. Izzy Gomez from Tugs. It was like a parody of a parody. It was like a bad. But it's like yeah. It was like come like on. A, yeah. It, it's it, like it, she's it, got fake tan on, and she's <laughs> she's going like, "Hey man, you tape are talking about the gentrifiers. Have you ever read the articles about? The is she movie? supposed to be a Native American in a John what, Wayne movie? She, she was. <laughs> <laughs> she was like absolute it was like absolutely it was it was barbarism it was total it was like oh my god this is the, the most racist thing is a white liberal doing blackface to get a job well what when, what happened that's dude... supposed to be put aside for a black person but what about when a black person <laughs> says they're not all black to get a job like now they're afro i'm afro Cuban. It's like you're not even from Cuba. Nobody in your family is even Cuban. Well, we need to get the paper bag passed out then, then don't we? <laughs> the we'll definitive paper bag out, and we'll do, we'll do, we'll do the paper bag out, right? Uh, <laughs> the paper bag. Does. A picture I mean, of Sammy like, Sosa on it. I mean, like it's it gets it gets really ridiculous at some point. I mean, that's the problem, right? Um. I mean, can you imagine, like, uh, Gene, the next hiring go around? You know how long it takes to hire people in academia? Yeah. And uh, and you guys are like, what? Look, we just need a diversity hire. And then the <laughs> the dean just comes out with the paper bag, and he just he holds it next to Terrain. And he's like, No, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> this nigga looks I mean, like, great. It's like, <laughs> it's like when we do our device diversity hire, are we using the one drop rule? <laughs> <laughs> is that is that how we do i like, I just don't know how you could execute this without being like supremely racist about like without it's like israel right like think about it it's like the way you get israel at least citizenship mm -hmm. is like kind of defined by the nuremberg laws <laughs> <laughs> It's like, uh, you know, it's like we're gonna we're gonna do the, we're gonna we're gonna like use the mechanisms for good. We're gonna use the one drop rule for good and the paper bag test. It's gonna be no, my brother. Mm. That's how you end up with Pascal in a parasol. Pascal in a parasol. We'll call him plantation par uh, plantation pascal. <laughs> plantation pascal that's all people so it's friday morning that's all people are getting is parasol pascal him and jeff doing this <laughs> <laughs> camera fuck camera that's all <laughs> special guest on the show bethany miller <laughs> Uh, Bethany is a historian of African American studies. <laughs> Professor of African American. <laughs> With her new book, Shades of Grey. Please welcome. 
It's beyond the paper bag. <laughs> beyond the paper bag. I came here for two things. To suck some hard candy and suck some dick. Whoa. Bethany. Bethany. Bethany from the... By the way, <laughs> actually, people are talking about in the chat. Did people see that uh, Bethany Mandel lady? Um, she went on Brianna Joy Gray's show, and Brianna Joy Gray asked her to define woke, and she had a breakdown. Yeah. Did you guys all see that? Yeah. I saw some thumbnails about I it. I saw a little I bit. Didn't... Of it, yeah. it was pretty funny because, like, people went back in her Twitter. She's, like, literally the most Karen Karen in Karen history. Like, she's bragging about getting, like, people from Koshamart fired. <laughs> you know, Why? She, she seems hot. She seems so, like, awful. Just what was her book? She wrote a book or something, right? About woke stuff ruining children. I don't know. And then, and then what? Because she read Kendi's book and her kid was all fucked up? I don't know. <laughs> her kid's first word was policy change. Policy change. <laughs> These sidewalks are racist. We need to get rid of dis anti discrimination clauses so we can have discrimination again, but for good. Kush looks at the most Karen Karen in her story. Jesus. Yeah, Christ. that's it. The most Karen Karen in her story. No, my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I think, we, I think, I think in recent years, we've, uh, in recent months, I think we've been taking a, a kind of hard, hard, Harder turn than usual against the um, identity politics stuff. I think I think we're all beaten down by it deep down. No, that's like the only uh, that's like the only terrain where people can get victories is the terrain of moralism. So I think we're going to get way more of it, especially if it's a boring election cycle. Oh, it's going to be that aren't going to be like super charismatic, not charismatic, but like polarizing. You know, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are two extremely polarizing figures for the contemporary political sphere. So. Honestly. To not have those two people in the mix anymore. Um, the fact that people are so wedded to these consumer choices, especially when it comes down to politics, um, it's just going to be a lot of identity fights and, and BS. We have a super chat for you, Jason. Yes. Jason, what was the spinoff of WKRP with Venus Flytrap in New Orleans that taught white America about the paperback test? <laughs> there was a spinoff of the Venus Flytrap. <laughs> There was a spinoff. I remember he had a show. His name is Tim Reed. Did he pass yeah. away recently? Oh, I don't know. His wife was the new Vivian. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Oh, did Reed. you guys? Yeah. What happened to the new West Prince, uh, uh, Fresh Prince? Did you guys? Oh, we uh, we talked about it a, a year. I know ago. you talked about. But has, is it still? Are they still making it? it? it I don't know what the Mean Rose is doing. Pretty reboot. I just found out Tyler Perry got an Oscar just for being black. He's got like Obama's motherfucking Nobel. Well, he should have got a he should have got one, but for playing Baxter Stockman in the Turtles movie. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, you don't. You know what? Baxter Stockman. <laughs> he was he was really good in Gone Girl. Did you see Gone Girl? Have you seen uh, Tyler Perry? Yeah, he was like one of the, he was one of the people in Gone Girl, and he was like, "You white people are crazy." That's what did it for you. <laughs> Well, no, they were crazy. If you have you seen Gone Girl, do you know what Gone Girl? Yes, is? yes. Because yes. I went to, you know, there was all these couples went to see Gone Girl, and when they all left Gone Girl, they were like, I don't know if I. I, I saw it. that after I was going through my first divorce. Oof, a not a good, uh, uh, not a good one to to be dealing with during a divorce. That's what she said. <laughs> it is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, classic. Yeah, I see. Omar agrees with me. Tyler Perry was great in Gone Girl. Stole the show in my book. I thought Tyler Perry was great in was it Don't Look Up? His character had me crazy. Oh, yeah, he was like people dog on Don't Good Don't Look Up, and I think there are big problems with that movie, but there were like some pretty funny aspects to it. I don't remember. I honestly I don't remember Gone Girl that much. I just remember the twist. Yeah. And I was like, oh. Was a good Chris. It's a good twist. Does does Sarah like Gone Girl? Sarah likes Gone Girl. She's busy. I don't know what she's watching right now. She is watching. Uh, probably watching. American Idol. No. Is that still the show? She's American been watching. Ca she's been watching Carnival Row, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, which has. Um, I thought you were going to say she's been watching Cops. No, no, no. She's been watching Carnival Row, and she keeps saying, "Oh, you got to watch Carnival Row." And I'm like, "I'll watch it," but I haven't watched it yet. And it's got Orlando Bloom in it, but it's gr- grim, grim, dark Orlando Bloom. He's like, "I'm gritty, really, gritty, gritty." I'm gritty, Orlando Bloom. Oh, I'm gritty. <laughs> I'm gritty, mate. And and it's a uh, it's a steampunk <laughs> thing where all it's like he's he's gritty, Orlando Bloom, but he's also a fairy. So it's can, like, he, can he oh jesus you mean like in the he flies like that he's uh he's he, no he's oh. half fairy he's got like fairy oh. Oh, okay so you mean okay you're gonna oh. say fairy tendencies is what you're gonna say <laughs> 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 you just barely got out of this one <laughs> so he's like, there are literally fairies in it so she's been watching uh She's been watching that, uh, and um, <laughs> I guess I just watch Star Wars nowadays. Bad Batch. There was a new Bad Batch, and then there's also I saw, I, yeah, I saw there was a new. And I, I just a, need if I had some time off. The good thing about being in Mexican custody is they didn't take your phone, so mm. <laughs> they take your cherry. <laughs> <laughs> Did they come up to you and go, Senor Jason? I like Senior you, Jason. and I want you. No, they we could not. do this the easy way, or we could do this the hard way. The choice is yours. Your phone or your <laughs> cherry, man. They didn't turn into a. They didn't turn into a fucking plantation owner. I declare, <laughs> I'm taking someone's ass, Jenny. I declare. Now you, you gotta, you gotta look, understand I this. Busty. These young thugs coming in here with their sagging pants. That's sexy. That's sexy with that ass hanging out. I just grabbed that. You know, that's uh it was, basically. Not, it was not whatever whatever weird foghorn leghorn fantasy you have going on. Oh, you've not seen you've not seen that slim fleece Johnson video? Yes. That, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm just fleece is in there looking for you. Is is a they, Jason they, Miles, they, they my were tired girl of me. now. They were, <laughs> they were so <laughs> tired of me asking all these questions. But yeah, if you want to see what uh, just blatant, we're not even trying to cover it up corruption looks like. <sighs> yeah. Well, you know. It happens. I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. It was a very important lesson. I had to learn it. Somebody asked, what do I think about Andor? Andor was really good. Did you watch Andor in the end, Jason? <laughs> Is that another one of those? Fans? No, my. <laughs> Star Wars? You didn't watch Andor? Is that, was that what they did? No, I, I only watched those first <clears throat> two episodes that came out, and I wanted, I wanted, like, when I'm gone doing the the tour for the the documentary, I'm, I want to actually, while I'm like riding, actually watch catch up on stuff. Nice. So when I'm gone, you know, premiering the movie, then I'll catch up on life. That's um, until now. It's it's all TIR all the time. All TIR. Well, I'm very excited about the new Magic Mike movie because it has my favorite actress in it. Who's the most beautiful woman in Hollywood? Sarah Bosley. Is she in Hollywood? <laughs> Channing Tatum? She's it's Channing not, Tatum. Not yeah. Channing Tatum. Not a woman. No, the, no who's who's in the new Magic Mike movie, guys? I don't know. Did they, I didn't know they made another one. Rachel Dolezal? <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that, actually. <laughs> I would watch that one. <laughs> well, Somebody said Salma Hayek. Salma Hayek. There you go. Okay. Salma Hayek is... Uh, very good actress. Jason's like, hmm. Mm. I'm going to go home and watch Magic Mike now. Wow. No, I am home. Salma Hayek. <laughs> Tessa, someone said Tessa Thompson. Tessa Thompson was at the studio once. And she walked by. And I was like, who the fuck? <laughs> and she like looked back and waved. And I was like, I... Have you ever seen someone like so fine you can't even talk right? You're like, I didn't. Her? Oh, dude, yeah. 
Okay, I understand people are different in person. A little smaller than I thought. But uh yeah, I was kind of like, whoa. I didn't I didn't realize who she was. Well, you know, it's getting late, and you guys have sent Zal to sleep. He's now asleep over there. We were so boring. Aww. He's fallen asleep. He, I don't know if you can see him behind me. But I love no. it. He just he's he's like he's got into his little bed and he's asleep, having a nap. Adults talking is boring. I would have never guessed. I would grow up and have this as a job. <laughs> so he's never he the leg shackles on him so he can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> You're not moving. <laughs> Hello, little fellow. But <laughs> oh, stay your little ass here. I got the plastic sheets on you, little <laughs> badass mother. <laughs> hey, Zal is a legend. Well, when uh, Bestner said hi, I was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> What's going on?" <laughs> He just, Very uh, responsive, that Daniel Bessner. <laughs> he's alert. It's the cocaine. I believe that's <laughs> I, Someone I, said Rachel Dolezal should have replaced Gina Carano. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been amazing. Oh, oh, oh. oh I wish. Oh, I, it was back. Oh, I wish. Oh, if you're real, give me that kind of Hollywood pull. It would have been good. I got a proposition for you, Walt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what the kid can do. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, before we go, G Tucson was messing with me. She said that before I moved to Mexico, I looked like an unemployed uh, jazz musician. <laughs> I, said, I said, Tucson, do I look like a jazz musician right now? She goes, yeah. I said, don't look employed. She goes, you look like you work in the industry in some capacity. <laughs> Moving up in the world. Zal, do you want right. to do you want to say anything to Jason Moss before we go? Uh, four is in my birthday. Oh, it's has been his birthday. How I'm old sorry. are you, Zal? I'm four. Are you this four. many? Zal, are you this many? One, two, three, four. He's four. There Are you, you this many? Are you this many? Are you four? Four. He's, he's showing you his fingers. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. It's gang signs. Four in the gang house. <laughs> Teach him gang signs. So, Zal, you know my son Phoenix is four as well. You guys are both four, and you can go walk around and be like, four, 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 something. four, four, four year old gangs. What you finna do? Four. Let's say so. I used to vote. What is it? Eh, eh, four, eh, eh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jordan gets it. He just wants to be answered. Tell <laughs> okay. him to say uh, pr- hit like. So okay. can you say hit like and subscribe? Let us subscribe. There you go. I'll okay, take it. Boy, so tired. Okay, little boy. I know you're tired. You're tired. So you know? night, night, baby man. Good night, Gene. guys. I'm good, night. Good, night. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Tucson, good night. And we. Goodbye. 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 I think maybe that's what we do. Zal, can you say, can you say we are out, Zal? Say we. We are. Out. out.